Story 1. To give some context, my girlfriend and I both 22 years old are in a long-distance relationship and don't get to see each other too often. She's visiting me now, and I decided to book a nice hotel for the last weekend so we could unwind a bit. I have a 16-year-old cat and took her to the hotel with me because she can't be left alone, and I couldn't drop her off at my parents' place or find someone to watch her. When we arrived at the hotel, I told my girlfriend to sit in the lobby with my cat and wait for me while I checked us in. I suggested she take my cat out of the carrier and put her on her lap just to clarify. My cat was on a leash because the carrier really stresses her out, and she's used to being on a leash. Then, I went to speak with the receptionist. There was a woman with a little girl, maybe around five or six years old, in the lobby. When my girlfriend took my cat out of the carrier, the kid saw her and started pointing and yelling about the kitty. The woman got up with a child and greeted my girlfriend. At that moment, I decided to join them because we were in Brazil and my girlfriend is American and doesn't speak Portuguese. The woman commented that my cat was really cute and then proceeded to ask if her daughter could pet her. Asking would have been completely okay if the child hadn't started touching my cat as she asked, as if I had already said yes. I firmly said, no, and the mom looked at me like she couldn't believe I wouldn't let her little angel touch my cat. My girlfriend pulled my cat closer to her trying to gently get the kid to back off, and I said, please tell your daughter to stop touching her. The mother then took the girl's hand away, but looked visibly upset and asked why she couldn't pet the cat. I explained that my cat is fine being around strangers, but doesn't like being touched. She's old and could get stressed by the situation. The mother responded with, but my daughter loves animals and has such a way with them, she'll like her. Lady, I already said no. I was getting quite frustrated at that point, especially since I hadn't even finished checking us in yet because she interrupted me. My girlfriend was just sitting there watching the whole thing since she couldn't intervene, but she told me later on that she wished she could have slapped the mom, not that she would actually do it, of course. I told the woman, I understand, but the answer is still no. I don't want anyone touching her. Then, I told my girlfriend to bring my cat and come with me to finish checking in. I'm a big animal lover, and I adored animals as a kid too, so I understand it's not really the child's fault. However, I was really bothered by how insistent the mother was, and especially that she allowed the child to touch my cat without my permission. In a situation like that, the child could have even gotten hurt. It was also strange that the hotel staff didn't do anything. I'm not sure what they could have done, but probably something. At least, other than that, our stay was nice, and my cat had a great time too. Story 2 I, a mixed-race 21-year-old female, was adopted when I was a year old. I was adopted with my little brother to a white family with five other kids. They first just wanted to foster us, but fell in love and adopted us. Here's the crazy backstory. The state I lived in was given a grant for all the non-white babies they placed in homes, so a lot of non-white babies were adopted fast. I was born in 1999. My birth mother had her other kids taken away from her, so she left the state before the social worker got to the hospital. Since I was born with drugs in my system, I had withdrawals and had seizures, but was never taken to the hospital out of fear. My birth mom got high and went into labor with my brother while visiting her dad, so we were back in the state she ran from. When my brother was born the head nurse called CPS. They got to the hospital fast after they learned their lesson the first time. My birth mom never saw my little brother. I was a year old in the recovery room with my birth parents, and the worker came in to tell her they were taking my brother. Seeing me they asked who I was. She at first said I was her niece till my birth dad not getting what she was doing told the truth. They took me too, and she never came to court dates. They took us on Thursday, and my now family got us on Friday. We joked that we were to buy one, get one free since when they adopted us. The state gave them a discount for keeping us together. She went on to have two more kids and one was taken, and she got cleaned raising her last one. When I was 18, I found her on Facebook and we met. I occasionally visit her. She's a little bit much for me. 
when I told my parents her side of the story about how bad she wanted us. They showed me the files that proved otherwise. She even had another couple set up to pay her $9,000 for my little brother, and my parents had to go to court to keep my brother with their couple. What kind of person sells their baby? Well, I had a baby in December. I'm half black and half Caucasian. My husband is completely Caucasian so our son came out fair-skinned. My birth mom is fair-skinned and my birth dad is very dark, so I'm what they called light-skinned black. My birth mom started calling my son her baby, telling everyone he looks like her and not me. She told me, if someone asks whose baby he is if we are out in public, I'm going to tell them mine because that's more believable. He was born on the 10th of December, so because of COVID, we were only letting close family who had their Tdap shot, flu shots, and quarantined for a week without symptoms to see the baby in person. It was Christmas Eve, which happens to be my husband's grandpa's birthday. We absolutely adore each other. He tells my husband's cousin, I'm the favorite grandkid. They had done everything we asked, and he wanted to see the baby for his birthday. The day before my birth mom asked if she could come visit the baby, I tried to explain it was only immediate family and all the requirements. She didn't care and showed up to our apartment while we were gone. My mom called me saying she showed up to her house, crying, saying we were keeping her baby from her. We felt bad and let her see him, the whole time saying her baby. She then told me that my dad's birthday was coming. I was confused because my dad's birthday is in May. She meant my birth dad and was furious when I was confused. I explained to her that since they didn't raise me or help at all, that I didn't see her as my parents. I told her I was grateful for her and sympathized with her, but she had to understand where I was coming from. She stood up with my baby to leave. My husband tried to take the baby back, but she kept saying, grandparents have rights. She wouldn't sit down and I couldn't help much since I had a rough C-section so I called the police. When the police came, we explained the situation and she claimed grandparent rights again. The officer explained to us that it was a real thing and she would have to go to court though. He gave us our son back. Story 3 I am by no means an expert or a professional at revenge, but I am a patient person I disclosed this to a friend, and they directed me here. This is a throwaway account for obvious reasons. It's a long read, but the setup and backstory are important. Seven years ago, I was fortunate enough to buy my own place. I had saved for ten years, worked incredibly hard, and was so happy to finally have a place to call my own. Now, being a single person on the mortgage meant I had to make compromises, one such compromise was buying a property on a shared block, which was a lot cheaper. Where I'm from, this usually means it's on a strata title. For some, that's a bonus, as it means there's a communal fund for repairs, typically cheaper insurance due to collective bargaining and maintenance being taken care of. However, strata titles also come with a lot of bylaws and restrictions on what you can and cannot do. I'm a pretty private and introverted person, so having to deal with people and limits on how I live was not ideal. I took my time and found the perfect property. It was a shared block, but had a freehold title. The only thing was that I needed to pay public liability insurance for the shared walkway on the property, which was split equally between the owners. The real estate agent was local to my area, and there were also about three degrees of separation between us he had friends who were friends with my friends, that sort of thing. I didn't know him personally, but knew of him, so that felt somewhat reassuring. About five months after I moved in, I got a knock on the door from the owner-landlord of the property next to me to discuss insurance. Not a problem, I thought, and I asked for a copy of the policy so I could have a record. It was sent through, and to my surprise, it was for Strata Insurance. I was incredibly confused. After much back and forth, it turned out the property wasn't a freehold title, but a strata title. I called my lawyer, who handled the conveyance of the title. He was dumbfounded, but did his best to make things right. I arranged for a meeting with the real estate agent. I brought emails and printouts of the advertisements, all stating it was a freehold property, as well as emails between the real estate agent and my lawyer discussing its freehold status. 
Despite it being in black and white, the agent refused to accept any fault or offer anything to make things right. I don't begrudge that. He's looking out for himself, and I get that. However, I wouldn't forget it. I entered into mediation with the real estate agent, and all I asked for was that when the time came for me to sell, they'd do it or cover the costs. I thought this was reasonable, but they flat out refused and offered me $1,000 to go away, which I declined. I had the option to pursue them legally and was advised by the mediator to do so, but ultimately I decided against it for a few reasons, the main one being my health at the time. So I planned and plotted, and I schemed and devised a way to get back at this individual, and I settled on this. I found his personal Facebook page, which wasn't set to private. I saw some photos of a boys on tour trip he went on a few weeks prior, about five or six months after I bought the property. I also found his address through a business registration search. On the anniversary of the sale, for six years straight, I sent him flowers with a note. Dear real estate agent, remembering you on this, our special day. She has your eyes. Love, L. The notes varied slightly over the years, but always included the phrase, on this our special day, and some odd reference to a love child and a desire to reconnect. From time to time, I also arranged for postcards and letters to be sent from another country. The one he had been on tour in, always signed, Love, L. About three weeks ago, I learned that this man had recently divorced, lost his home, and was no longer working as a real estate agent. His wife had found out he cheated on her. The story I was told through those friends of friends went along the lines of, he would get weird gifts and flowers every year, on the same day, every year. She, his wife, finally put two and two together and realized what the date was, and he admitted to cheating on her. Now, I didn't intend for this to happen, but it turns out that a year before I bought my house, he had gone on holiday, came back with a sexually transmitted disease, and gave it to his wife. Somehow, he convinced her that it wasn't him. As such, our special day turned out to be right around the time he had been unfaithful, just one year earlier. He's apparently lost his house, half his retirement savings, and his business. I do feel a little bit guilty about all of it sometimes, but then I'm reminded that he's not a good person, and that karma, like me, is a patient, spiteful, and vengeful force. Story 4. First, a little backstory. I had flown down to a large city in Texas, won't say which one over the weekend, to visit an uncle who is in failing health. Yes, he knows I'm gay and doesn't have a problem with it. I'll be making arrangements to move back home to my land and into my guest house later this month. But that's not important to the story. My current living conditions and family situation aren't great. Anyway, this happened shortly after boarding my flight home, and it's one of the most ridiculous things I have ever witnessed. Let's introduce the cast. Me Huggy Bear, a flight attendant, a federal agent, a police officer, and Karen. Before boarding, I sat in the lounge for passengers, relaxing with a cup of coffee. While sitting there, I noticed a rather loud, obnoxious lady berating one of the airport staff about her seat not having been wiped down. She was nicely dressed, with shoulder-length raven hair, and looked to be in her late twenties, I think, but she had a major attitude problem probably learned from her mother. On and on she went, yada, yada, yada. Security approached her and told her point-blank that if she didn't calm down and stop using foul language in front of children, there were several families in the terminal, she would be escorted out of the terminal and not allowed back in. That seemed to calm her down. But once she sat, she kept grumbling to herself quietly, slowly working herself up into another tantrum. As we all know, airlines have to take precautions due to what's going on and maintain social distancing on airplanes. But we also know that people like her don't think rules apply to them. Our flight was announced, and we all rushed to the gate in an attempt to be first, like a bunch of kids jostling for position in a school lunch line. It was crazy and amusing at the same time a madhouse for a few moments. I, another former serviceman, and a pregnant woman were put in the expedited line and allowed to board first. This immediately set the woman off on another rant. 
she stepped out of her line and tried to bully her way through the expedited line, but it didn't work, and she was forced to go back to her original line. She immediately started throwing elbows in every direction, trying to claw her way back to her previous spot and elbow her way further. But she was stopped short by a very large man who simply got in her way, completely blocking her from moving any further forward. He leaned down and said something quietly to her, and she blanched and backed off. I mumbled a little loudly, about time someone put that lady in her place. Her face instantly turned red, and she looked at the man in front of her but wisely kept her mouth shut. Yes, I was deliberately provoking her, hoping she would get herself tossed out. I can be a bit of a troublemaker sometimes. After my carry-on was scanned, I was thanked for my service and sent on up the ramp. We took our assigned seats and settled in. In most cases, that would be the end of it, but we all know people like her. Everyone else eventually boarded, passing my seat. I chose a middle seat. As she passed by, she pretended to drop something next to me and whispered, jerk, which I instantly responded to in a whisper, rude woman. That set her off, as I had hoped. She snapped upright as if she had never been insulted before, mouth agape, at a loss for words for a few seconds, and then yelled, How dare you? I remained calm, having accomplished what I wanted already, and said back, Go sit down and stop bothering me, rude woman. And she was off, loudly ranting and raving, calling me all sorts of names that I won't repeat here as it could get my story removed. That's when this huge man stepped out of his seat and invited her to leave the plane with him. She immediately turned on him and started ranting at him, screaming that he needed to mind his own business, blah, blah, blah. That's when I saw it, she had one of those undetectable nylon knives in her hand. I yelled, knife, and lunged for her to grab her wrist and twist it out of her grip. But the huge man was faster. He had her down, disarmed, and one arm behind her back in seconds faster than I could get up. He said, Federal agent, now we're going to take a little trip back down to the terminal, have a nice little chat, and see what happens from there. All the while, she was shrieking, demanding the police, screaming that she was being assaulted, and on and on. Airport security arrived quickly, with a police officer in tow. They got her up, the man winked at me, and they dragged her off the plane with her howling and shrieking all the way, trying to blame everyone but herself for the incident. That agent, he knew, knew, I had provoked her just to get her to go off. I did that because I didn't want to listen to her incessant whining and complaining throughout the flight home. Later, after the police had taken statements, the flight was allowed to leave, almost two hours late, but it was worth it. Later, the flight attendant walked down the aisle, passing out drinks and snacks it wasn't a long flight. I commented to her, Wow, you folks have it tough sometimes, having to deal with people like that. Sometimes worse, I would imagine. You have no idea, she said back to me. I smiled at her, thanked her, and she moved on to continue her duties. To all the rude people out there, watch out you never know when you'll run into someone who won't put up with your nonsense. As for the agent, he was back on the flight before it left. We had a nice long chat during the flight, exchanged contact information in case he needed a witness, and in the end, I wound up with a new fishing buddy. Story 5 I haven't been on Reddit lately due to a personal matter with my girlfriend. Her only remaining grandparent caught COVID and was hospitalized. We left town together and drove a couple hundred miles to go and support my girlfriend's family. Because my girlfriend and I have been together for so long, I'm rather close to her family. Her parents often joke that one day I'll be their son-in-law whether I like it or not. But while my girlfriend and I were away my mother found out where my sister and future brother-in-law live now. I kind of expected that to happen at some point but I figured after saying we were disowned that maybe my mother would leave us alone. But evil Mamabar will always be evil Mamabar, won't she? While hundreds of miles away from home, I got a warning from my cousin that visits my mother that she'd found out some time ago where my sister was living by spotting her at the local supermarket and following her car home. 
Apparently, evil Mamabar just didn't say anything to anyone that she knew for a while, but let it slip to my cousin that she knew, and was giddy about getting her daughter back, as she supposedly put it. My sister is a creature of habit and tends to go shopping at the same places and times weekly, and our mother knows that, so her tracking down my sister this way isn't all that surprising. But my sister never goes out without her fiancé anymore, and he told me he's always packing a taser now. Apparently evil Mamabar waited till I wasn't around to make her move. She's craftier than I gave her credit for. I phoned my sister that I'd heard from our cousin that evil Mamabar knows where she lives, and to be ready. And the following day evil Mamabar showed up at my sister's front door with flowers and the Bible. She rang the doorbell several times and my sister did not answer, so she resorted to crying and banging on the door to make a scene, and finally my future brother-in-law answered, and he had both a wireless camera nearby on a table and a police-style body cam that I gave them to record with just in case this happened. As soon as my future brother-in-law opened the door, evil Mamabar threw her arms out like she was going to hug and kiss him only to pull back as soon as she realized my sister wasn't the one to open the door. She looked completely stunned to be face to face with my future brother-in-law for a moment before finally speaking. Mom, I'm looking for my daughter. Please let me see her. Future brother-in-law, I don't think so. Whatever you want to say, you can say from here. Please, I have to talk to her now. This is all a huge misunderstanding. My sister emerges from another room. What I understand, Mom, is that you are a racist who hates my fiancé, demanded I abort my baby, and then tried to attack me. Then you disowned me by saying you no longer have any children. What about that was a misunderstanding? Mom holds up the Bible. Please, I wasn't myself then. I've done a lot of soul-searching and gone to church. I've found God. Come home. You can live in my bedroom. I'll sleep in the basement. I'll even let your boyfriend move back in too, total lie. My cousin would have told me if she was going to church. She hates it. She'd probably start burning alive if she even set foot in one. And from what my cousin also told me, she's never once stopped referring to my future brother-in-law by racial slurs. Sister. Oh, what about how you referred to us all as racial slur? and then broke Craggle's windows with rocks that had more racial slurs written all over them. I did what I had to do. Craggle ruins everything. Craggle didn't ruin anything. He just finally opened my eyes to what kind of person you really are, and what person I let you turn me into. Mother? Don't you mean mommy? No, I mean mother. I'm never calling you mommy again, okay? Mom starts bawling and holding up the Bible again. But the Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother. Future brother-in-law. Yeah, and it also says not to provoke your children to wrath. Have you even read it? Or did you just buy it along with those flowers on the way here? But the Bible says. Not to lie, steal, commit adultery, or bear false witness. How many of those are you guilty of, huh? Sister, all of them. Mom throws everything in her hands to the floor. It's Craggle, isn't it? He's turned you against me. Everyone is against me, she said while stamping her foot. Craggle didn't do anything to do that. It was all you. Then I kid you not my mother let out a loud noise and then proceeded to lunge at my sister. But my future brother-in-law intercepted her and had her pinned on the floor in seconds pretty easily as she's not a big woman. Future brother-in-law, honey, call the police. Mom, you can't do this to me. I am your mother. You're supposed to love me. From there on, it was just some repetitive nonsense while my future brother-in-law held her down until police arrived. Predictably, as soon as they showed up, evil Mamabar started screaming. Mom, help. This racial slur is attacking me for just wanting to see my daughter. He's brainwashed her. Do something. I do not want her near me. Evil Mamabar struggled a bit more, and the cops had to restrain her. She ended up screaming at them that they were all racial slurs too, which got her a shiny new pair of bracelets and a frog mark into a police car. The police got a copy of the camera footage and then carted Evil Mamabar off to jail. 
still waiting to find out how that one is going to go down. My future brother-in-law has mentioned possibly wanting to go after her for a hate crime because of the racial slurs she used. Sis threw the flowers into the trash. And my future brother-in-law dropped the Bible that she brought with her into a church donation bin. He said it looked like the kind you'd find in a department store book rack anyway. I still can't do a lot because I'm not at home. But my sister and future brother-in-law said that they are going to file for their own restraining order soon. Story 6 My sister is the cliché of a spoiled, wealthy individual, typical of Beverly Hills. Though we don't actually live there, whatever she wants, she gets, and she'll do whatever it takes to achieve that without having to work for it. She has made it clear to me that she's the chosen one and that I'm nothing. My attitude through all this has been one of indifference, letting her deal with the issues our parents have created. I'm content with my life. I've earned my degree and established my career, and I'm doing well. I've had conversations with my mom about this in the past, and it seemed like she might have taken what I said into consideration. It even seemed like she was starting to work on fixing some of the issues my sister had. When it comes to my parents, or really my family in general, I don't actively seek them out. I talk to my parents maybe once a month if I'm lucky. I let them call me, and usually, it's one parent who will relay any necessary information back to the other. We also live almost three hours apart, which is another reason why we don't talk much. Apparently, the issues my parents have created with my sister have escalated and become worse than they've ever been. Things have gotten bad enough that my mom drove three hours to visit me. Imagine my surprise when I opened the door to my house and saw my mom standing there. During our conversation, she told me she'd heard what I said about my sister being unproductive and that she was trying to slowly fix the problem. She thought she was making progress until she found out that her husband had bought my sister a condo and was covering all her expenses. I asked her why this mattered to me. I reminded her that I was just an issue that had to be dealt with. Those were her and my dad's words to describe me and my existence. I reminded her that there was nothing I could do to help them or fix the problem they had created. For the first time in my life, my mom acknowledged this and admitted that I had been treated poorly. While she didn't exactly apologize, she did say that I was treated pretty badly. She told me she was telling me this because it needed to be brought out into the open somewhere. I had to ask my mom some really tough questions mostly because I was trying to understand some of this in my own way. My parents' marriage, for the last few years, has mostly been like their roommates. Divorce is out of the question for them because of how complicated their finances and estate are. If they were to divorce, it would be amicable. They don't love each other the way they should. They love each other as friends, but the romantic love is gone. With that being said, I asked my mom a direct question. Have you or dad been unfaithful? She immediately responded that she had not and truly believed that Dad hadn't either. I asked her if my sister had something she was holding over Dad's head. She asked what that could be. I asked her if maybe Dad and my sister were involved in some kind of unhealthy relationship and she was blackmailing him to get what she wanted, threatening to go public if he didn't comply. I pointed out that up to this point, she had received the usual spoiled child perks, a car, credit cards, vacations, and trips, all of which my mom was also involved in. This condo purchase was more than any spoiled child could ever expect in their lifetime. I reminded her that when I was 18, I was told that I was on my own and had to figure out life. My sister, at 25, still has no idea how to be an adult. It makes me wonder what they're not telling me or what secrets they're keeping that give my sister this much power over them. Again, my mom insisted that, in her heart of hearts, this wasn't the case that they just messed up pretty badly. If this were an am I the jerk post, this is where I would come across as the jerk. I asked my mom what she expected me to do about this. What did she think she was going to gain by telling me all of this, and what did she think I could do about it? She admitted that she knew I couldn't do anything about it. She acknowledged that there wasn't anything I could do to fix this, but said again that she just needed to get it out in the open. I asked her if she confronted Dad about it, and she said that his excuse was that he was trying to help my sister get out of the house 
and that this was the only way he felt he could. He said that retirement for both of them was on the horizon and that they would make the money back once they liquidated and downsized. I told her that from their standpoint, it would make sense. But Dad forgot one major issue my sister can't maintain herself. Mom said this was an issue she was trying to address with my sister. She sat her down and told her that she needed to work on figuring out her future and was trying to encourage her to get her real estate license and go into the family business. By this point, I was upset, and I didn't even know why. I told my mom that I didn't want to know anything more and that I just wanted to be done with this whole conversation. I told her that it made no sense for her to tell me any of this. I offered to let her sleep in one of my guest rooms. She said that was okay, but she had reservations at a hotel. She left, and I went to bed angry. This morning, I had my aha moment. I realized that I can't do anything about this, and there's nothing I want to do about it. This literally doesn't concern me. All I can do is let it go in one ear and out the other. I have nothing to offer. And even if I did, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. Update. In response to a comment, it was mentioned that my sister might end up draining my parents' resources, causing them to lose everything and maybe move in with me. This will never happen. The thought of them going from living in luxury to a three-bedroom double-wide in a trailer park is laughable. If this ever did happen, which I assure you it won't, I would be strict. My response to any of their complaints would be to hold the door open for them and tell them they're free to leave and that I don't want them here to begin with. I would introduce them to people as my issues that need to be dealt with. But again, I cannot stress this enough, this will never happen. I'm hoping this is the last update on this situation. I read each and every one of the responses and replied to a few of them. With that said, I did what so many of you suggested, I have officially gone no contact. Again, I was going to post an update on Saturday, but time got away from me, and I just didn't have the time. On Saturday, I sent a long email to all three of them. I told them that I was done, and that there is realistically no reason for me to be involved with the family anymore, and that they are not to contact me. I laid everything out. I told them that they have no reason or excuse to tell me any of this since I was just an issue to be dealt with. I told them that I bring no value or purpose to their lives, and I don't understand why they still talk to me at this point. I also told them exactly what I thought about my sister. I didn't hold back. I told all three of them that I disliked her from the depths of my soul. She has been nothing but cruel to me and serves no purpose or brings any value to my life. If I never spoke to her again, I would be perfectly happy with that. I told them that if she were to pass away tomorrow, I wouldn't shed a tear, and I would most likely just spit on her grave. I told them that I didn't understand why they felt the need to constantly tell me about the problem they created or why they feel the need to ask me how to fix the problem they created. They did this all to themselves, and while my sister didn't have to do anything, I had to do everything. I reminded them that I got a job the first chance I could when I was 15, worked to put myself through college, and have been working at the same hospital for the last five years. I earned my degree and bought a house. She has nothing and can't do anything without their help. I reiterated that I will, under no circumstances, help them fix the mess they created. I reminded my sister that when she squanders the estate and has nothing left to live on, I will not help her and she will never be welcome on my property. I did, however, take it a step further. I don't know the current status of my parents' relationship, but I don't think it's in great shape. For as long as I can remember, they've talked about retirement, travel, and spending time with grandkids. Here's the kicker I'm gay, so they're not getting any grandkids from me. Even if I were to adopt, they would never accept my children because they wouldn't be blood-related. So, my sister is their only hope for grandchildren. And I told them this. You've always talked about retirement and grandkids. You do realize that I'm gay and have no chance of providing that. With that being said, your only hope for grandkids is my sister. Let me know how that goes. While we don't come from a culture that recognizes arranged marriage, now that I've put this idea in my parents' heads, I can almost guarantee that they'll have to find a way for my sister to provide them with grandchildren. 
I'm certain that one way or another, she'll be set up. I sent the email, attached read receipts, and when I got all three receipts back, I blocked them. I've blocked them on all social media platforms and on their phone numbers. The only way they can get in contact with me is by showing up at my house. I can't see that happening, and if they do, I'll have them removed. Many of you have wondered why I kept in contact with them. The truth is, I've gone no contact with them many times. They always find a way to weasel their way back into my life. And for a while, it wasn't that bad, and it was tolerable. But now that they've raised the stakes, it's time to take a different approach. This is what led me to send the email. I didn't wait for them to respond. I have no reason to look for any kind of response, and I truly don't want to hear from them. At some point, I need some kind of peace in my life, and I'll never get it with them.